My co-founders and I turned a $150 million initial offer into a billion dollar acquisition for Twitch. Here's part two of my best negotiation tips from my favorite negotiation book, Negotiation Genius. That was a lot of negotiations. In this video, I'm gonna walk through some everyday examples of how you can apply these strategies to your negotiations. How's it going? I'm Justin, Justin Khan from Justin.tv. So where did we leave off? Number four, not using questions to dig out information. Negotiation is a game of information. You need to maximize the use of questions wisely to dig out valuable information about the other party's incentives and goals. Negotiators who are able to obtain information perform much better than those people who just stick to what they know. The worst thing you can do is start your negotiation with the belief that your assumptions are correct. One of the examples given in the book is coming to, the, to negotiate the price of a piece of land while you're unsure about its commercial development potential. One of the things you could do in that case is mention commercial development in your questions to the other party, which implies that you know the potential true value of the land, even when you're unsure. And then keep prodding and asking about the other party's plan to find out more information about their intentions. You know, what this might look like practically is just asking. If I was going to this negotiation, I'd be asking like, so what's your development timeline? Or what kind of, do you have like your plan lined up with your contractors or your builders? Or are your plans submitted to, you know, whatever building authority there is? So those are all questions designed to extract information about what their intentions are. By asking those questions, I'm trying to understand, okay, are they trying to develop it into, let's say, a $100 million shopping mall? In which case, you know, my sale price might be some percentage of that ultimate outcome. Or are they just trying to hold it and let it appreciate, which means maybe um, they're not able to pay as much. One of the things the authors say, which I love, is that in the face of uncertainty, you want to interrogate indirectly while sounding sufficiently informed. That's the whole thesis of this YouTube channel, is that I'm trying to sound sufficiently informed. All right, number five, starting too narrow and not maximizing value. A common mistake that people make when negotiating is leaving value on the table by being overly contentious about a very few number of topics. For example, you might be going back and forth about with another party just about the price and ignoring all the other ways that you could create value with the other party. Poor negotiators think that there's a fixed pie to fight over. Genius negotiators try to enlarge the pie. So someone in my life who does this really, really well is my partner at Go Capital, Robin Chan. Robin is trying to do this all the time in our venture investments. He's always looking for creative new ways to expand the pie by figuring out what can we give the other party in lieu of you know, higher valuation uh, that is beneficial to them. So that might be things like, here's how we're gonna help you launch your product, or here's how we're going to bring other investors that you want uh, as follow-on investors at higher valuation. Robin's always trying to be flexible and figure out what are the other ways that we can help this other person without giving up too much of what we want. Is there a way for us to get creative and give the other party something of relative value that doesn't cost that much to us? In order to maximize value, you wanna introduce as many talking points to the table as possible. This drastically increases the opportunity for value creation. We're always trying to find treasure in another person's trash. Something that might be valuable to you might not be very valuable to them. And something that's very valuable to them might not be that hard for you. So for example, one thing that people always want is me to help them promote their companies. It's not that hard for me, you know, like it's very easy for me to throw in plugs into my YouTube or on my social media or LinkedIn or hunt them on Product Hunt. But that's something that I can give up that helps us get into tight investments or hot investment rounds or even get a better deal in our investments. If the other party values something more than you do, let them have it, but don't just give it away, sell it. The goal is not simply to reach win-win, it's to maximize value. So here are some additional tips from the authors on how to maximize that value pie. Mm, I love value pie. Identify your own multiple interests and the other party's multiple interests. And if you don't know, just ask them. One of the things that Robin does that I love is, is that he always says explicitly, hey, let's get creative. Let's brainstorm how we can make this better for both of us. Next, think of ways to leverage differences, priorities, and expectations. So this is the part where you're actually getting outside the box and saying, okay, well, I have this thing that I don't really, that's not that important to me, so I'm willing to give that to you, and I know you know, this could create a lot of value for you. And then lastly, communicate value clearly by using dollar values in a scoring system. So this means that you can turn all those creative ideas into like actual quantitative value and then figure out how to distribute that value fairly. Mistake number six not recognizing emotional and cognitive biases. One of the areas in this book that I really think sets it apart from other negotiation books is that it really breaks down the psychology of persuasion. So there's some tricks of the trade. One example, negative framing. 
which is really appealing uh, to what another party stands to lose, is much more persuasive than positive framing, appealing to what they're going to gain. Human beings have this natural loss aversion. But if you over-rely on that, it becomes fucking irritating. So think about like all the times that there's some sort of limited time discount or deal tactics that encourage FOMO to sell customers things that they didn't initially want, and like how that just drags and gets like so annoying. I, there have been so many times that personally, I've walked away from wanting to invest in a startup because I've been turned off because the founder continually is like, we're about to close our round. And like, this is, you know, we're around is 99% full or it's 3x oversubscribed. But like, for some reason, they're still emailing me. Sometimes that works. But if you only rely on it, it becomes a huge turnoff. Another great tip, aggregate bad news in a negotiation and chunk up good news. If you're gonna lay bad news on the other party in a negotiation, you wanna combine it all into one bundle and just say, hey, uh, I got some things to tell you, here's a bunch of things that like we can't give on. But if you have good news to give them, like a bunch of concessions that you're willing to make, those those out one at a time. The other party's gonna feel like they've gained a lot and they're gonna feel a lot better about the negotiation. You also wanna figure out your strategy. And here are two, door in the face and foot in the door. The idea behind door in the face technique is starting with a huge initial ask and then moderating down to something that seems more reasonable. Effectively, you're framing your ask in, this, in a really demanding way and then by rolling back to something reasonable, the other party feels good and you mostly get what you want. The foot in the door technique is when you make a small initial ask to start building a relationship with the other party and then you continue building upon that and asking for more and more. You're starting with compliance and then increasing your demand. This is best if there's some time between your requests to help you internalize commitment. Mistake number seven, not knowing how to negotiate from a weak position. Now, if you've ever played poker, which I love, you'll know that sometimes you have to appear strong when you have a weak hand. The same goes for any negotiation. Here are some strategies on how to negotiate from behind. Well, first off, obviously, don't negotiate your weak position. Avoid saying things like, time is of the essence. I don't even know who would say that, to be honest. Here's an example. One time I was um, selling my company exec and I was running out of cash. We're almost cash out. That is a horrible position to be in the very weak position, but we, I was able to stay strong in the face of the acquirer by saying, hey, we have these other alternatives. We, I have investors who will just write me another check to keep going. Even though you know I'm running out of money, it made it seem like I had infinite runway behind me because I was like, well, I can just go to these investors and I also have another acquisition offer from one of your competitors. That helped me force them to do the deal without changing the terms on us. We wanna be prepared with backup plans. That's gonna help you turn a weak position into one that is not as weak. If you can, divert attention from your weakness to theirs. In situations where both parties have a lot to gain or lose, usually the winner is the one that can manipulate the opposition's position better. So in that case, when I was, we were selling exec, one of the things I did was I kept pointing out that you know they were neck and neck with their competition and we could sell to either of them and really king make who was gonna win in that space. Now, was that actually how things were going to play out? I have no idea, but I do know it was an insecurity of the other parties. All right, here's some final negotiation tips for those extracurricular students out there. People aren't irrational. You should think of them as less informed than you and it's your job to convince them by informing them without being patronizing. Why is this a deal that's good for them? Be comfortable with silences. This one used to kill me. I just recently did a negotiation to invest in a company and there were so many times, this was asynchronously, and there were so many times when I didn't hear anything and I just wanted to give in. I was like, okay, I just want to take the deal. And my partner, Robin, was like, stay strong. Just don't say anything, wait. And eventually they came back and we got the deal we wanted. Another example of this, in the early days of Justin TV, we were getting threatened by a company that was a copyright holder for, um, they had some soccer rights, and someone had streamed that content to our site. It was streamed by another party and we were DMCA compliant, so we felt like we were legally in the right, but this rights holder was like, you need to give us $150,000 right now or we're gonna sue you. We didn't wanna get sued, but we also didn't have $150,000 that we wanted to give them. And so I said, hey, let's go back to them and say, we'll give you $150,000 in free advertising on Justin TV and call it a day. And so we made that offer and then they just said, no, we want the $150,000 in cash. My co-founder Michael was like, well, what do we need to do? And I said, let's just not do anything. Let's just be silent and see what happens. And so we just didn't respond. And six weeks later, they came back and said, okay, we'll take that free advertising now. When you're making concessions, don't put too many contingencies or ultimatums on them. It deteriorates trust. And lastly, don't just ask what. Ask why. This helps you understand the other party's needs and helps you find alternative solutions or ways that you can create value by giving each other concessions that each of you don't really care that much about. It's always helpful to ask why and try to understand the other party. 
All right, those are my favorite insights from Negotiation Genius. I highly recommend this book, whether you're someone negotiating billion dollar deals or just negotiating your first pay raise. Negotiation happens at every level of life. It's not just business. There's a lot more practical advice in the book that I don't have time to cover in this video, so give it a read if you're ready to level up, and I guarantee everyone's gonna find something useful in there. As always, show some love by hitting like and smashing subscribe, and I'll see you guys next time. Boom!